And so they set out in pursuit of this star to follow it to the place where it indicated that this king had been born. Now, I know that people try to restructure at Christmas time. You go to planetariums, a planetarium at my kids' high school, they would do the, the constellations at the time of the birth of Christ. It's kind of a neat little exhibit, neat little display. But remember, we're dealing here with something that is miraculous. This is not something we may be able to retrace using astronomical charts that can go all the way back to the first century because you can take the movement of the planets. They're so predictable. You can take the movement of the planets and the stars all the way back to what was going on in the heavens in 4 B.C. At any rate, it was enough for these magi to discern that someone had been born the king of the Jews, discerning o the land over which this star was poised. They identified it as the land of e uh, Israel. It was a sign that indicated the birth of a king. It's hovering over the nation of Israel. So they discerned that a king had been born, a king of the Jews had been born in Israel. So they track it to Jerusalem, and they say to people in Jerusalem, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Now this got back to Herod the king. Herod is the king. Now these magi, these wise men from Babylon are coming saying that there, we have an indication that there is a new king of the Jews who has just been born. Where is he? We want to go worship him. We want to go bring him gifts. And this, of course, is very troublesome to Herod because he was the king. So he interpreted this as a threat to his reign as the king. So he assembled, Herod did, all of the chief priests and the scribes of the people. The scribes were the students of Scripture. They were the ones that studied the Scripture. And he asked them where the Christ, the Messiah, is to be born. Now, this is interesting to me because they knew where to look for an answer to this question. Where is the Messiah going to be born? And these are the chief priests and the scribes. Herod says, look at this, study the word, come back to me with your best guess as to what the Bible teaches about the, where the Messiah, the Christ, is to be born. And they came back and said he's going to be born in Bethlehem, of Judea, because that's what the Bible says. Verse 6 of Matthew chapter 2, quoting from Micah 5, and you, that's emphatic in the Hebrew, you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So they tell the king, look, it's right there in Micah 5, it says that out of Bethlehem is going to become a ruler, a shepherd for the people of Israel. So Herod then called the wise men to the palace. He wanted an interview with them. And he ascertained from them what, and he did this secretly. Nobody knew about this. But Herod asked them, when did this sign first appear in the heavens, and we'll see what his uh, dark and sinister reason for wanting to ascertain the time that the star had appeared. Because when the star appeared, that signified to the wise men of the east that a king had just been born. So Herod wanted to know when this sign appeared because he wanted to know how old this ruler, this coming king of Israel, was And so they gave him the time when they first saw the sign in the heavens. So Herod sends him over to Bethlehem and says, look, he's still skeptical a little bit. He says, if you find this child, report back to me so that I too can worship him. That's not why he wanted to know where the Messiah had been born. He wanted to know where the Messiah had been born and who it was so he could send his goons to assassinate this rival to the throne. Well, the, the Magi were warned and they split. So they left. They did not go back to King Herod to tell them who the Messiah was and where he could find him. They left. They were warned and they left. So Herod had no choice if he's going to do this thing. He just has to order every child under the age of two. That means the sign had appeared in the heavens about two years prior to this story. You know, typically you have the Christmas story. It's all glommed into one. 
you got the Christ child in the manger, and here come the Magi from the east with their camels, and we three kings of Orient are giving their gifts to the Christ. Well, he was two years old at this time, and he was in a house. We see in this count that he was not uh, no longer in a manger. He was now in a house. And so they came, they worshiped at the feet of Christ as, as is appropriate for someone who is a king. They presented him with gifts. They bowed before him. They knelt before him and then returned to their home. Well, let's pray some of this back to the Lord. Lord Jesus, as the Magi from the East did, we bow down and worship you this day as our Lord and our Savior. We acknowledge that you are the ruler that was spoken of by the prophets, born in Bethlehem of Judea. You are the great shepherd of the people of God. You are the fulfillment of many ancient prophecies spoken long before your birth. As you did with the Magi, I pray that again in our day, you will bring cultural leaders in our own nation and in nations around the world to fall down and worship at the feet of Jesus. I ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hi, I'm Kevin Sorbo. You may know me from my TV series Hercules or Andromeda or one of my hit films such as Let There Be Light, God's Not Dead, or What If. I wanted to invite you to offer your full support for the ministry of Preborn and its leader, Dan Steiner. The team at Preborn is very focused and very successful at saving preborn babies from abortion. The ministry of Preborn saves babies' lives through ultrasound. By letting a mother hear her baby's heartbeat and see her baby in the womb, she'll choose life 80% of the time. For $140, you can help save five babies' lives. All gifts are tax deductible, and 100% of your gift goes to saving babies. To donate, go to preborn.com. That's preborn.com. Or dial pound 250 and say the keyword baby. That's pound 250 and say baby. Every baby deserves to be born. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. My name is Abraham Hamilton III and this is the Hamilton Minute. Attorney General Jeff Sessions announced a new Religious Liberty Task Force in the Department of Justice to defend religious freedom. In his remarks, Sessions mentioned the Southern Poverty Law Center as a threat to religious liberty, suggesting the new task force may investigate or target the regressive smear group. Sessions said one group actively targets religious groups by labeling them a hate group based on their sincere beliefs. He continued, a dangerous movement, undetected by many, is now challenging and eroding our great tradition of religious freedom. It must be confronted and defeated. Listen each weekday from 5 to 6 p.m. Central for The Hamilton Corner with Abraham Hamilton III, public policy analyst for the American Family Association. This is Focal Point with Brian Fisher on American Family Radio. Howdy and welcome back to Focal Point on American Family Radio. I am Brian Fisher, your congenial, convivial, and amiable host. The program is Focal Point, the home of muscular Christianity on conservative talk radio and you are listening to the American Family Radio Network. This is Focal Point, the fastest 60 minutes in American media. Now, big thing happened this week that we want to make you aware of. I've got a column up at the American Family Association, AFA.net, on the front page there, on the stand. Uh, the title of my column is Jeff Sessions Completely Discredits the SPLC. So I encourage you to go there and read it. It will dovetail nicely with my conversation with our next guest, Matt Sharp. He serves as senior counsel with the Alliance Defending Freedom, ADF. That's the group before whom Attorney General Sessions spoke. And he directs the Center for Legislative Advocacy there at ADF. Matt, welcome to Focal Point with Brian Fisher. Thanks for having me on. Well, it's great to have you with us. And I want to get right into the significance of what Jeff Sessions said in this speech to the ADF about the SPLC. He's the head of the Department of Justice, which means he's the head also of the FBI, which is a subset of the DOJ. 
So Matt, summarize for us. First of all, let's talk about the SPLC. Before we get to what Jeff Sessions said about the SPLC, tell us from your vantage point, what is the SPLC and what is the problem with the SPLC? Yeah, well, the SPLC was formed decades ago to uh, combat civil rights problems and to go after uh, the Ku Klux Klan and organizations like that, true hate groups that were targeting African Americans and other minorities. And unfortunately, in the decades since, they've lost their way. And rather than being a, a group that had initial noble purposes, they've now become uh, a group that simply exists to launch defamatory attacks against conservatives and, and others that they disagree with in order to obtain, uh, uh, to raise money from liberal donors. And so they have essentially become uh, just another group that just likes to throw bombshells and, and allegations and names like hate groups in order to fundraise from people that agree with their worldview. You know, it seems from my vantage point, Matt, you don't need to comment on this because I'm speculating here about the kind of motives of the SPLC, but, you know, they made bank out of fundraising off civil rights abuses. They had a famous case. Uh, Jeff Sessions, by the way, had gotten a criminal conviction, the death penalty, for a Klansman who had killed a young black teenager. The SPLC then leveraged off of that, and they pursued a wrongful death lawsuit against the KKK, Got a seven, uh, and the SPLC got a $7 million settlement against them, bankrupted the KKK in the South, and then they went out and raised a ton of money off of that conviction. Now, the KKK didn't have any money, so all they, the only asset the KKK had was this busted-down warehouse, and that's all the mother of this teenager got. That's all, and the SPLC, meanwhile, went out and raised about $9 million off of that and didn't give any of that to the mother of the teenager. But I think what happened, Matt, as the whole fear over civil rights died down, as fewer and fewer of these kind of cases came through the pipeline, they had to look for another way to make money, and they decided that the way we'll raise money is we'll scare people to death about what conservative groups like American Family Association, Family Research Council, Alliance Defending Freedom, what they are doing, and we'll make that our meal ticket. So it seems to me, Matt, just a craven... A uh, craven strategy to raise money off of fear mongering. You have any reaction to that? I, I completely agree. This is for SL, SPLC has been a fundraising campaign, and it's been successful for them. They have leveraged their their designation of hate group to go after conservative groups, to go after those who um, oppose uh, Muslim violence, and even groups like that. And they've used it to raise obscene amounts of money, um, but there are real-world consequences to that, and there are consequences to the people that get slandered with that name, um, of their ability to operate and, and getting kicked off programs like Amazon Smile and things like that. And so, although they may you know, view this as just a fundraising campaign, which I don't think they do, they know what they're doing, and they want to go after those that have different views than they do and punish them with this designation, but it is a attempt to grab money, and it hurts good organizations that are out there trying to stand for religious freedom and other principles that matter to a lot of people. You know, in the SPLC, talking here with Matt Sharp from ADF, Alliance Defending Freedom, uh, they were able to kind of hoodwink the federal government, especially under the Obama administration. You know, they were, the, the, they were working with the U.S. Army, they were working with the Pentagon, they were working with the Department of uh, Justice. And finally, some of these organizations or these agencies of the government began to see the, si uh, see the light I think the U.S. Army decided to stop using them as an authoritative source in about 2013. In 2014, the FBI removed the SPLC from its list of trusted resources, but it is still on the FBI uh, website. So we'll see if the current attorney general does something about that. Even the Obama Department of Justice, Matt, rebuked the SPLC for overstepping the bounds of zealous advocacy and demanding the silencing of the Federation of the, the American uh, Group on, on Immigration, FAIR. So, um, so they had the federal government actually putting their imprimatur on the SPLC, Matt, and creating the impression that this was a reliable, dependable source for identifying groups that peddle hate in America. But these groups have began to see the light, and I think Jeff Sessions kind of put the nail in the coffin. 
last night. Talk right. to us about what, what Jeff Sessions said in his remarks to the ADF. Well, I think a couple of things. One, he, he brought up that last year he had, he had spoken to us, and there was so much outcry. Oh, how dare the Attorney General speak to this so-called hate group, Alliance Defending Freedom. And he came back this year and called him out on it and said, these news outlets should know better than to rely on a discredited source like the Southern Poverty Law Center uh, to just repeat these allegations and call out the media for that, call out tech companies for that. But then he, he made you know an, a, sta- a statement we absolutely appreciate. He looked to everyone here and said, you are not a hate group. Uh, you are a respected law firm. We've had nine victories at the Supreme Court in the last seven years, and that was encouraging. But the other thing that I thought was equally as important is, in conclusion, he said, you know what? The federal government, the Department of Justice, not only are they not going to work with real hate groups, but they are not going to work with groups that defame Americans, that defame groups that are standing to defend the Constitution. And I thought that was an important statement of his principles, that groups like Southern Poverty Law Center that are just out there to throw accusations and hurl names and the same hardworking, good Americans that believe in the Constitution, that the Department of Justice is not going to cooperate with them anymore. That was a profound statement because of the way they've been able to buffalo the federal government. Uh, Matt, we've got about 30 seconds of sound from Jeff Sessions' uh, speech to the ADF. Uh, was it Monday night or Tuesday night or Wednesday night? I forget which night it was. but It was Wednesday night. Wednesday night, yeah. Okay, so, so last night. So anyway, let's listen to about 30 seconds of sound from Jeff Sessions speaking to the ADF last night. But when I spoke to ADF last year, I learned that the Southern Poverty Law Center had classified ADF as a hate group. So you and I, I may not agree on everything, but I wanted to come back here tonight partially because I wanted to say this. You are not a hate group. Well, that's pretty definite, Matt, and that kind of leaks all the air out of the SPLC balloon when you've got the Attorney General, the Chief Law Enforcement Officer in the United States of America, and say that ADF and the other groups on this list, by implication, they're not hate groups. That's right. It it was an encouraging reminder that people are going to have disagreements about views and things like that, but organizations like ADF and others that have been unfairly labeled by the Southern Poverty Law Center that are out there defending the constitutional rights of every American, defending the freedom of religion for every American. Those are not hate groups. And to hear the Attorney General say that, I think, was a big boost of confidence to all of us that are in the trenches fighting for these freedoms, uh, but also just a a welcome uh, extension of President Trump's and the Attorney General's um, strong defense of religious liberty and, and their dedication to working to defend those freedoms for everyone. Well, Matt, I know that you at the ADF were very pleased to hear these words from the from the Attorney General. We here at the AFA, American Family Association, we were likewise pleased because the AFA and the FRC, we were the first two groups that were victims of this institutional jihad on the part of the SPLC. We were the first two pro-family groups that were tagged as hate groups, and we were tagged as hate groups simply because we refuse to accept that homosexuality ought to be normalized behavior, and we refuse to accept the conceit that two homosexuals can form a marriage, quote, end quote, and for that we got tagged as a hate group. So it felt good to us, too, to see the Attorney General come out so strongly. And this is what Jeff Sessions said, I want to make sure that we do not partner with any groups that discriminate. And, of course, there he's suggesting that the SPLC discriminates, Matt, against groups like ADF and AFA and FRC. We will not partner with groups that unfairly defame Americans for standing up for the Constitution or for their faith. So it seems to me when he says that, he's spotlighting, I think, Matt, one angle of this that's rarely talked about is that in these cases where religious liberty, for instance, conflicts with the homosexual agenda, there's discrimination that's taking place, but the discrimination, the bigotry, is being directed at Christians. And everybody out there thinks that discrimination can only go one way against homosexuals, but here in these Kate cases, Jake Phillip or Jack Phillips and all that, you clearly have discrimination against people of faith 
who are just acting out of Christian principle and on the basis of their constitutional rights. So anyway, it seems to me, Matt, we got about a minute here. It seems to me this could be a new day dawning on the American uh, landscape for religious liberty. I, I think so, and I think it's part of a trend we're seeing. We saw it in Jack Phillips' case where Justice Kennedy specifically said, you know, Jack Phillips, those are sincerely held beliefs. They're beliefs held by so many others, and it was wrong for California to compare his beliefs to to the Holocaust and other things like that. And now we've got the Attorney General calling out the Southern Poverty Law Center for those same types of uh, accusatory terms. I think we're seeing a shift of respect for people of faith in America. Matt Sharp has been our guest. He serves as senior counsel with the Alliance Defending Freedom. He There he directs the Center for Legislative Advocacy. Uh, Matt, I want to thank you for taking time out to chat with us. I think this is a very significant moment in actually in the civil rights movement when you look at the civil rights to exercise your religion according to conscience. Big moment last night at the ADF. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it. God bless you, and God bless the work of ADF. Thank you. Bless you, too. All right, Matt Sharp from Alliance Defending Freedom. And again, I want to uh, remind you that my column is up at afa.net. You can find it right there on the main page, afa.net. Jeff Sessions completely discredits the SPLC. I encourage you to read it and share it with like-minded friends. Spoke a point, American Family Radio. Be right back. This is Dr. Richard Land, president of Southern Evangelical Seminary. Welcome to Bringing Every Thought Captive. I am asked the question all the time, why do President Trump's supporters remain so intensely loyal to him? William Galston explained some of the important reasons why in a recent Wall Street Journal column. First, because of President Trump's promised deregulation and tax cuts, the economy has revved into high gear, generating hitherto lows in unemployment and growth rates not seen in over a decade. Second, the president is keeping the promises he made to those who voted for him. He has given economic conservatives the deregulation and the tax cuts he promised to give them. He is giving social conservatives the judicial nominees they wanted and presidential support for pro-life, pro-Israel, and pro-traditional family policies. Galston points out populist conservatives see Trump championing America first policies on immigration, trade, and a strong military that caused them to vote for him in the first place in the presidential election. Americans are not used to a presidential candidate who actually tries to keep his promises. That's what can happen when you elect someone who is not a professional or career politician. This has caused many people to overlook some of the president's rough edges, his tendency to personally attack his opponents, uh, his tendency to tweet in ways that many people find unpresidential. They overlook these things because the president is keeping his promises to the millions and millions of Americans who voted for him. And after all, isn't that the first thing that we should require and expect from those that get our vote? This is Richard Land. This is Focal Point with Brian Fisher on American Family Radio. Listen to the audio podcast or download today's program at AFR.net. You can also read Brian Fisher's columns at AFA.net. AFA.net. Howdy. Welcome back to Focal Point on American Family Radio. Quick processing what happened on Tuesday night in the primaries. Here's the Washington Post. So Tuesday night was not a good day for Democrats. Number one, all five of the candidates that Donald Trump endorsed on Tuesday won five for five, five and O, oh, didn't lose a uh, one. Uh, here's the headline from the Washington Post again, which leans left, this piece by Dave Weigel. He's a guy that I've talked to on a number of occasions. Uh, the headline is Democratic Party's liberal insurgency hits a wall in Midwest primaries. Here's the first paragraph. The Democratic Party's left-wing insurgency found its limits on Tuesday night with voters favoring establishment candidates over more liberal challengers in almost every closely watched race across several states. So the Democratic Party's liberal insurgency 
hit a wall in the Midwest. Uh, so that, um, I think I got another story here, maybe underneath this one that I want to mention. Um, so anyway, uh, not the blue wave that everybody's talking about. All of the candidates that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez endorsed and campaigned for struck out all of them. Uh, so she didn't have a good night. The Muslim, by the way, in Michigan lost. He was running there. His name is El Saeed. He was running to become the, the Democratic governor of Minnesota, full-blown Muslim, connected to the Muslim Brotherhood. He's into Sharia law. The whole nine yards would have been a radical moment in American uh, politics. And uh, he uh, got a bloodbath, lost 52 to 31 in his uh, primary. Uh, and uh, let's see, uh, on the voter fraud front, People say, ah, oh, there's no voter fraud in America. Here's a case out of Hersham, Habersham County, Habersham County in Georgia. They have 276 registered voters. They got 670 ballots <laughs> oh, wow. turned in. So well, that's that's a pretty good uh, turnout. Yeah, that's what two, is that? Three hundred percent? Two hundred and forty three percent. Well, you don't even see that in Venezuela. I you know. know. <laughs> All right, so you got some pretty civic minded folks yeah. down there in yeah. Habersham uh, County. Uh, Donald Trump still loved by his base. A headline from a Pew uh, Research uh, story from the Pew Research Center for most Trump voters very warm feelings for him endured and so the whole point i won't go into the details but the whole point of this article is that the people that love donald trump and voted for him in 2016 they still love him and still would vote for him now uh, let me just give you one uh, example from the poll in march of this year 82 percent of those who voted for Trump said they felt warmly toward him. 62% said they had very warm feelings for him. So this is very similar to what Trump voters had in 2016. At that time, 87% had warm feelings toward him. That's just slumped down to 82%. That is hardly a blip. So once again, Donald Trump maintains the affection, the admiration, the enthusiastic support of his base, and that is a good sign. You know, and he's got some coattails. He goes into these communities, he endorses, or into these states, endorses candidates, and they win. You know, Troy Balderson, uh, that's still going to have to wait for all the votes to be counted, but looks like he's going to emerge from that unscathed. Now, um, let me, one more story before we get into the sound bites. You've seen this out of New Mexico. And you won't know this if you follow the mainstream media. This was the compound, a squalid New Mexico compound. I'm reading off the CBS News version of this. Uh, he is the son of a controversial Brooklyn imam. The guy that was running this compound was on a list of people who are co-conspirators to the 1993 World Trade Center Bombing. So this guy is a Muslim. I don't think they use the word Islam or Muslim anywhere in this story. I mean, they'll use the word imam and hope their people don't know that that means a cleric who is a Muslim in his religious convictions. And these students in this filthy compound, I'm a horrible conditions, child abuse charges probably be filed against these two men who were holding these kids in these squalid conditions. They were conducting weapons training with assault rifles in this compound, teaching these children to use assault rifles in attacks on schools. Now, one interesting thing is the Taos County Sheriff, Jerry Hogreef, he said this, and CNN included this in its first report on this deal, that the adults at the compound were, quote, considered extremists of the Muslim belief, end quote. The next time that story appeared on CBS, uh, I mean on CNN's website, that quote was gone. The quote from the sheriff that they were extremists of the Muslim belief just 
disappeared. So once again, the media in the tank for the religion of Islam. All right, let's get some sound bites in before we are out of time in the fastest 60 minutes in American media. Let's grab clip number R2. This is kind of a cute clip from the Republican National Party, by the way, because the Democrats all over the place were talking about how close they came on Tuesday, uh, a a as if this represented some significant advance. They, they didn't win, <laughs> win anything, but hey, we got close, and they were trying to make the best case. They were trying to take these lemons and turn them into lemonade, and here's what it sounded like all across the Fruited Plain from candidates and the media alike. Close in Ohio 12, but no cigar, at least not yet. This is a moral victory for the Democrats. The fact that they're this close is a moral victory for the Democrats. Right. You want a real victory. We got some mojo, all right? So I don't know if it's a moral victory or whatever. Moral victory. The moral victories. Moral victory. <laughs> moral victory does not get you an office exactly. in Washington. Moral victory isn't going to cast a vote <laughs> here in Washington. Come November, you need more than moral victories. You're going to need to get better than close in some of these races, correct? You say, said this morning there are no silver medals in politics. Yeah, that, that's it. Second place gets you oblivion, not a, civil me a, a silver medal. Moral victories do not a House majority make. They've got to get across the finish line in these districts in November. Either winning seats or you're not. A win is a win. A win's a win. It don't matter if you win by an inch or a mile. <laughs> Winning's winning. Winning is winning. That last clip, that was from one of the Fast and Furious. Uh, it was Vin Diesel. That was Vin Diesel from one of the uh, Fast and Furious films. It doesn't matter whether you win by an inch or by a mile. Winning is winning. And the Democrats had no taste of that on Tuesday night. Now, let's um, move into an update on this uh, charade of the trial of Paul Manafort. Uh, and this thing is a charade. You know, the only reason this guy's in the crosshairs is because he's connected to Trump because he managed his campaign for like three months. That was it. And because he's connected to Trump and Bob Mueller's going after him for stuff that he did as far back as 2006. And all the stuff he did, all the stuff that Manafort did, and it looks like he's probably going to prison. I'm not trying to defend him. Looks like what he did was wrong. He shielded income, guilty of tax fraud, bank fraud, uh, you name it. So he's guilty. But the only mistake that he made, he probably would have gotten away with this if he hadn't hooked up with Trump because then they started looking at everybody in Trump's orbit. Who can we get in trouble? Who can we pressure that might flip on Trump? Well, they're trying to get Manafort to flip on Trump. I think the problem is that he doesn't have anything that he can flip with. Let's uh, pick up some sound bites. Let's go to Saul Weisenberg, clip number one. He's a former deputy independent counsel in the Whitewater investigation. So he's been around the block on this whole deal. And here's what he had to say. And don't forget, yeah. when, when, Jaworski, when Jaworski won the tapes case against Nixon, and when Cox won the earlier case, they knew their subpoenas were incredibly narrowly drawn. They knew the tapes existed. They knew there were potentially yeah. incriminatory conversations on those tapes. Mueller mm -hmm. does not have Very that. Different. And more than, more than the, anything the, else, Mueller does not have the right to even litigate executive privilege. The first thing President Trump is going to say is, I'm your boss. You can't even be in court. So the reason why Mueller has put up with these ridiculous preconditions is that he probably can't win if he goes to court. He probably can't win if he goes to court to try to get Trump to show up for an interrogation session. He just doesn't have what the prosecutors had in the Nixon days. I mean, they knew there had been criminal conduct in the Nixon case. They knew about the break-in and all that kind of stuff. So they knew there was some crime that was at the bottom of all of this, and they figured very likely that there were going to be incriminating conversations on these tapes because these people would be talking about the crime. And he says, look, Mueller doesn't have that. There's no crime, number one. And because there's no crime, there's very unlikely that they would have any tapes or any recordings where they would have any kind of incriminating conversations. I won't play the tape for you, but remember, we had this Russian guy went after um, uh, Adam Schiff. 
and said that he had pictures, I believe, nude pictures of Donald Trump. And Adam Schiff is like salivating over this. Remember the big beef that everybody had with Donald Trump is he was willing to get dirt on Hillary Clinton. He was willing to meet with people of the opposition to get dirt on Hillary. Here's a guy from Russia, dangles this in front of Schiff. This is supposed to be terrible, horrible, no good, that you would get dirt on a political opponent from the Russians, and this is dangled in front of Adam Schiff. He can't wait to get his hands on that. So that just shows you the hypocrisy of you know the whole business. Now let's grab clip number two. This is Lindsey Graham talking with Harris Faulkner about the difference in the way that the authorities approached Donald Trump and Diane Feinstein. Let's listen. One of the things that we didn't talk about, I didn't know about it until yesterday, apparently about five years ago, the FBI told Diane Feinstein one of her employees may be an agent uh, of the Chinese government. That was the right thing to do, and she fired them. I'm going to send a letter to uh, Director Ray next week and ask him, what is the policy? Why didn't you tell President Trump that you had concerns about Carter Page? Is there a double standard here? If this was a counterintelligence investigation, not mm -hmm. a criminal investigation, uh, the FBI should have told President Trump they had concerns about Papadopoulos and Page. Why didn't they do for Trump what they did for Feinstein? You know, that's a great question. I mean, Diane Feinstein had a Chinese spy in her employee for 20 years, in her employee for 20 years. She drove his limousine. Imagine you're back to school shopping and your little girl comes running from the restroom in tears saying she saw a man in there. Sadly, scenes like this are playing out at Target stores across the country. Their policy is to allow men into women's restrooms and fitting areas. If some of us don't stand up and say this is wrong, what comes next? Protect your family and send Target a message by doing your back-to-school shopping elsewhere. Learn more and sign the Boycott Target Pledge at AFA.net. Caring about the direction our nation is headed is one thing. Doing something about it is another. The Values Voter Summit in Washington, D.C. is the premier gathering for equipping Christian conservatives for returning the culture to one that values human life, encourages families, and defends religious liberty. Plan now to join other Values Voters on September 21st through the 23rd. Learn more and register at valuesvotersummit.org. valuesvotersummit.org, sponsored in part by AFA Action. Hi, I'm Will Addison. And I'm Miki. From Airing the Addisons on Urban Family Talk. We'd like to invite you to the Marriage, Family, and Life Conference coming up August 17th and 18th. The list of speakers is amazing. We have Ryan Baumberger of the Radiance Foundation, Dr. Clarence Schuler of Building Lasting Relationships, Abraham Hamilton III, Pastor Bert Harper and his wife Jan, Stacy Washington, Lonnie Poindexter, Pastor Dexter Sanders, and we'll be there too. There's a direct attack by the enemy on marriage and family, and babies in the womb are treated like political footballs instead of life. We want to encourage and equip the body of Christ to fight for the restoration of the family. If we can get our families on track, a lot of society's problems could be solved. The Marriage, Family, and Life Conference is from Urban Family Communications, a division of the American Family Association. You can learn more and register at Urban Family Talk. Dot com. American Family Radio. You're listening to Focal Point with Brian Fisher. Brian Fisher. Howdy and welcome back to Focal Point American Family Radio. Just one other thing on the Trump deal. You know, we mentioned uh, Brian Fisher is my name, the program Focal Point and the network AFR, American Family Radio. You know, we mentioned that Donald Trump's standing among blacks has doubled. His support among blacks has doubled from a year ago from 15 percent to 29 percent. And that threatens, ladies and gentlemen, to wipe out the Democratic Party. You know, we were told if if they get down below 85 percent support from the black community, the Democrat Party will be toast for decades. That's their power base. That's what they depend on. That's what they count on. And now we see that among Hispanics, Donald Trump's, as according to an NBC Wall Street Journal poll, Trump's approval rating is at 39% above Latinos. You know, this is after the relentless trashing that the media has been doing, that Trump has got some kind of racial problem, racist problem with brown people. That's why he wants to build a wall on the border because he hates brown people. He hates Hispanics. Well, it is not percolating to the average Hispanic voter. 
Now, let's go to clip number three. This is uh, Rudy Giuliani, who, of course, is Donald Trump's attorney, one of the two major attorneys. He's got Jay Sekulow being the other one. Talking here with uh, Sean Hannity about the nature of this investigation, and he's talking more and more, uh, and more and more people are starting to get the picture that this is an investigation that is illegal and unconstitutional from the start. Because remember, the law requires, if you're going to have a special counsel, you've got to have a crime identified in the fundamental paperwork that he's supposed to investigate. No crime has ever been identified. Nobody still, nobody yet has been able to identify any crime that Donald Trump was even supposed to have committed. So Bob Mueller, after a year and a half on this deal, he's got no crime he can even suggest that Trump might have committed. So they, Rudy Giuliani talks about this with Sean Hannity. Can it get... Uh any worse. I mean, what do we need to know that this is a totally illegitimate investigation based on uh, a, a report, a dossier that was paid for by Hillary Clinton and the Democrats? Probably the biggest illegality so far, the biggest collusion so far. Or conspiracy. Completely made up, completely made up, uh, led to nothing except several fraudulent Pfizer wires. And now we have Mueller, who doesn't seem to care that he's sitting on top of a totally illegitimate investigation. All right, so Mueller sitting on top of a totally illegitimate investigation, illegal investigation. And I'm sure that Bob Mueller, at some level, knows it. He just doesn't care because his target is Trump. He's willing to break the law. He's willing to violate the Constitution in order to accomplish his purpose for this investigation, which is not justice. It's not to get at the truth. The purpose of the investigation is to get Trump. Here's the second of the two Rudy Giuliani, Sean Hannity clips, clip number four. The reality is the real story here is not that this case isn't going to fizzle. It's going to blow up on them. The real question is what we talked about before. There's a lot more to what they did that nobody knows about yet. Oh, yeah. I know. Trying to bring Steele back in after he was completely discredited. And then feed it to Mueller. Yeah. And uh, Mueller is going to have a lot to answer for. Mr. Mayor. I, I said a long time ago, th the investigation here has to be in the investigators because we can't let this happen again in American history. We may not have a president as strong as uh, President Trump. Uh, the, uh, a lesser president could have really been cracked by this. Again, what if I lied to a judge? Mm. I wouldn't think of lying to a judge without well, getting you, my, my you, life you, you, in jail you'd, afterwards. You'd be investigated for, uh, for, for perjury. You'd be investigated for contempt. Uh, your career would be ruined. Your life would be ruined. And, and, and I believe that when this plays out over the next year or two, it's not going to be about President Trump. It's going to get over with. It's going to be about all the things they did. This, this, you know how sometimes the, the cover-up is worse than the crime? In this case, the investigation was much worse than the no crime. You know, and that's a standard saying, the cover-up is worse than the crime. They say that about Nixon. The problem was he tried to cover up the original crime, which is a third-rate burglary. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was what got him eventually impeached. It wasn't a crime. It was because Nixon had no advanced knowledge of the crime. He couldn't be held liable for any part of it. But he tried to cover it up, and that's eventually what led to his uh, undoing. And here, you know, Giuliani is saying, <laughs> look... There's no crime to cover up here unless it's the cover-up that Mueller's trying to do of his tracks. That's the only crime. The only collusion is between Hillary and the Russians, not between Trump and the Russians. And they're talking here about trying to bring Christopher Steele back, and this is how they're trying to do it. Remember, he was fired. Christopher Steele was fired by the FBI because he was leaking stuff to the media. That's back when they pretended to care about such things as leaks to the media. So they just fired him as a confidential source after he had produced the Steele dossier with FBI money and Hillary Clinton money. Uh, and it turned out that Bruce Orr, who was the fourth in command at the FBI, fourth in command. This guy wasn't a flunky, wasn't down at the bottom of the food chain. He was fourth in command at the FBI. His name was uh, Bruce Orr. And his wife... Nellie Orr worked for Fusion GPS. This was the firm that was being paid the money to dig up the dirt on Donald Trump, and they were paying Christopher Steele to do it. And Christopher Steele 
had been fired by the FBI, has, had been told he's no longer a credible source for any FBI work. We can't use you. We can't hire you. And we discover after that happened, there were 12 separate meetings between Bruce Orr and Christopher Steele after Christopher Steele had been fired from the FBI and tagged as a non-credible source. Well, what's the deal? Well, Bruce Orr is married to Nellie Orr, who's working for Fusion. They're the ones digging up dirt. So she becomes the conduit then through Christopher Steele to pass the stuff that they're digging up, pass it to Christopher Steele, who then meets with Bruce Orr. So there's a little bit of separation between Nellie Orr and Bruce Orr. So Christopher Steele is passing on this dirt after the election, passing on this dirt that they claim to be digging up on Donald Trump. So everything is bad and hinky about that. Here is uh, John Solomon from The Hill talking about this Bruce or Christopher Steele business in clip five. Then when Christopher Steele is fired by the FBI, he's told, the FBI told him, you're no longer suitable as an asset to, to be a source, and you may not gather any more information under the color of the FBI. And what happens? 21 days later, Bruce Orr is gathering information for Steele and giving it to the FBI, and Pete Stroke is right there playing uh, wide receiver catching it. It's extraordinary. The FBI is violating its own rules. It's probably misleading the FISA court. The Justice Department has kept us in the dark about this for 18 months. Justice Department has kept us in the dark for 18 months. In other words, they've known about this. And they've been trying to cover it up. So I think the real scandal in all of this, ladies and gentlemen, is going to be the effort on the part of the DOJ and the FBI to cover up their own misdeeds, their own criminal behavior. They're the ones that have behaved in a criminal fashion, and they're trying to conceal it. They're trying to paper it over. They're trying to cover it up. So I'm going to predict at the end of the day that's going to be the real scandal in this deal. It's not going to be anything that Trump did. They still have nothing on him. You know, we heard in our first uh, soundbite today, uh, Saul Weisenberg, who's uh, experienced in special prosecutor work, special counsel work, he said if, if uh, the prosecutor, if Mueller was to take this thing to court, uh, try to get Trump, he, wouldn't, he couldn't do it. That's why he's prolonging everything and trying to, to string it out. Now, I want to play one, shifting gears here before we are out of time, shift uh, gears to the immigration issue. Uh, here is uh, Andy Cuomo. This guy is the governor of New York. Remember, New York City is a sanctuary city. They get somebody, they turn them right back out on the streets. And we're re reading stories all the time, fresh stories almost every week, where somebody that had been captured, had been detained by law enforcement, was turned over, they're housed in jail. A detainer was put on them by ICE, and they don't honor it. They just let them go. After the time is up, they just let them go. So here's Andrew Cuomo kind of defiant about what he's going to do about this. Clip number six. I will do nothing cooperatively with ICE. Uh, I have sent, sent them letters asking for an investigation. Uh, I have said if they do any criminal acts, which a police force can do, uh, we will take criminal action against ICE uh, because I believe they are politically motivated. So he's going to take criminal action against ICE. This is the second person. Again, I don't have any idea how they'd go about doing this. I mean, these are federal agents that are enforcing federal law. They got the right to do what they're, what, what they're doing. I don't know how you take them to court, what you would take them to court for. Uh, and, of course, with the judges we've got, the activist judges we've got, no telling what they might actually be able to get away with. Give you one example of how bad this thing is. This uh, is a story from uh, April. Ramon Pedro showed up at the point of entry in Texas. That's where you're supposed to go, port of entry. Showed up with a juvenile girl he claimed was his daughter and demanded entry into the United States. With so many so-called family units just like them, border officials acquiesced. So they released the man and his daughter into the country on the assumption that they would show up for their court date. This is the whole catch and release business. When they showed up for their tuberculosis screening in July, the medical staff that treated them at a hospital in Fresno were horrified to discover that the girl wasn't even related to the man. In fact, 
she'd been repeatedly raped and sexually abused by this guy. The young girl's mother had actually handed her over to Pedro. He's a human smuggler. He promised the mom, I'll get her to the United States and find her a job. So you wonder why they want to try to make sure that every child that shows up at the border with an adult is actually related to that adult because of cases exactly like that. Well, that's it for today, ladies and gentlemen. As I promised, the fastest hour in American media. Do not forget to bow low before God, stand tall before man, stand in the gap, and as ADF and Jess, Jeff Sessions proves, we are fighting a winnable war. See you back here tomorrow. The views and opinions expressed in this broadcast may not necessarily reflect those of the American Family Association or American Family Radio. Faith, Family, Freedom, American Family Radio. As millennials, we have more than a trillion dollars in purchasing power. So you know businesses are watching us. But millennials are losing our faith. So we know Satan is watching us. Engage Magazine is for millennials by millennials. And it speaks to faith, purpose, and a closer walk with Jesus. Because above all, God is watching us. Visit EngageMagazine.net and listen Saturday afternoons at 530 Central on AFR. Faith. Family. Freedom. American Family Radio. A ministry of the American Family Association. This is American Family News. I'm Steve Jordahl. A New York Republican congressman has pleaded not guilty to charges of insider trading. Here's Fox's Jared Halpern with more from Washington. Congressman Chris Collins learned June of last year of a bad drug trial for a company of which he served on the board. Prosecutors say shortly thereafter he passed that tip on to his son. Congressman Collins had an obligation, a legal duty, to keep that information secret until that information was released by the company to the public. U.S. Attorney Jeffrey Berman says Collins' son Cameron told his fiance's father about the tip too.